Well, I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk about the role of whistleblowers in improving the integrity of the evidence base. And uh, I am on the steering committee of a whistleblower group. And I think nobody would publicly, at least, disagree with the need for integrity in the evidence base in medicine so that patients get the best available treatment and that future research is not biased by flawed data so as to avoid harm to subjects and prevent waste of resources. And, of course, no one would dispute the need for um, integrity in uh, patient safety, yet we've had repeated problems with that where, for example, and these are just a few examples, um, uh, pediatric anaesthetist Stephen Bolson, who exposed the problems with pediatric cardiac surgery in Bristol, had to leave the country because he couldn't remain in employment in this country. And in places like Midstaffs, more recently, where staff who spoke out felt ignored and others were deterred from speaking. So there is a problem between what people say publicly and what they actually do. And this year we've had uh, three reports highlighting the mistreatment of whistleblowers in the health service, one from the House of Commons Health Committee, one from Robert Francis' Freedom to Speak Up review, and most recently a review commissioned by the GMC on how it treats people who raise concerns and whistleblowers, and it found that in fact the, the GMC, the body that regulates and uh, licenses doctors in this country does not treat them very well and that in fact employers use reporting whistleblowers to the GMC as a, a punishment and a deterrent and we know from Hooper's report and I know examples of whistleblowers that have been denied revalidation unless they withdraw concerns that they have raised about patient safety. Well, if we're talking about the guardians of the integrity of the evidence base, these are the ones I thought of off the top of my head just in a moment, and you can probably think of a few others. But the problem is that many of the leaders are conflicted, and they would rather protect the reputations of their organisations than protect the integrity of the evidence base. And I'm going to stick with a few examples, and that, because I've only got about 20 minutes, I'm just going to stick with a few British examples. There are international examples, and I'm often asked to investigate, uh, or sometimes asked to investigate, in other countries. And um, I don't think we're worse than anywhere else, but I want to stick with British examples. And one example that ra raises some of the issues was a cardiologist, actually, who I reported to the GMC and who was suspended from the medical register 12 years ago. But we know that for years earlier, whistleblowers had raised concerns with his hospital about matters to do with research. And his medical director, Professor Peter Richards, uh, chaired an investigation and with the trust board agreed a severance deal with Handler that if he left quietly, they would actually pay him to go. This is a man who was dishonest. They would pay him to go, but more importantly, they would not tell the General Medical Council of his dishonesty. And the key thing is that Richards, who made this deal, was himself a member of the General Medical Council at the time. So, in fact, he was chairman of the Professional Conduct Committee. The GMC, as you know, has various subcommittees, uh, at present, the disciplinary body has changed its name from the Professional Conduct Committee to Fitness to Practice, but essentially it was the same committee. And it also has education and standards. But in effect, Richards was the chairman of the Conduct Committee, the chief judge of the GMC, and he had done a deal to conceal misconduct with a doctor. And you can see that Richards held senior positions including being chairman of the Council of Deans of UK Medical Schools and Faculties. So if people like that will conceal research misconduct, who won't? And in fact, the funniest, my funniest experience of uh, the GMC was on the first morning of Handler's hearing 
because Richards was due to be chair of the hearing and the GMC's own lawyers objected to him chairing the hearing and he had to excuse himself and they had to rummage around to try and find a new chairman, which took some hours. But I, I always say it was rather like going to the Old Bailey to hear a murder trial and the judge, the Lord Chief Justice, says, I've got to uh, stand down from hearing this case uh, because I helped the accused bury the body. And, but the GMC didn't see the problem. They allowed Richards to return to chairing other conduct committee hearings afterwards, and they refused to take any action against Richards. Richard Eastall, Research Dean, Sheffield University, Director of Research at Sheffield NHS Trust, researching residronate in osteoporosis, was funded by Procter & Gamble, the makers, for £4 million a year. And all he had to do was take the papers that Procter & Gamble gave him, put his name as first author and submit them. And of course, he was a very eminent, he was chairman of and president of various bone societies in Britain and Europe. And of course, his papers got accepted and he hadn't seen the data. And uh, he had a senior lecturer at Aubrey Bloomsome and Procter and Gamble thought that Bloomsome must be in on the deal. So they submitted two abstracts with Bloomsome's name on and gave him a paper, said, put your name as first author and submit this. And Bloomsome said, well, what is this? Where's this data? What is, I don't know anything about this. And they refused to show him the data, so Eastall initially went to the university, which refused to do anything about it. Why would they? They were getting four million pounds a year from Procter and Gamble. So Eastall, uh, sorry, Bloomson went public. Procter and Gamble then were forced to release some of the data, and they showed that, in fact, they had been falsifying the results omitting data points. In some studies, a third of the data points were omitted in order to make graphs look more acceptable to show their drug, residronate, was as good as competitors, not better. They were just trying to make it look no worse, and in fact, it was much worse. And this went to the General Medical Council, but Bloomson withdrew from the hearing and said he wouldn't give evidence because the GMC were not... Uh, putting all the appropriate charges of all the cases and instances. In fact, they put a limited number of charges, uh, but they agreed that Easter had put false statements such as he, um, in papers such that the authors had seen the data when they had not. The GMC said that putting such statements was negligent, not dishonest. Uh, although this, these were studies of uh, hip fractures in elderly people with osteoporosis, the GMC decided there were no issues regarding patient safety. They decided they would not issue a they would not even issue a warning, which is the lowest sanction, um, because that would have a detrimental effect on Eastall's ability to secure future funding. And they said it was a single episode in an otherwise accomplished career. Well, it was a single episode because they hadn't put all the cases that they should have put. But what's more, in 2006, Eastall had to resign from being the um, research dean at the university and director of research at the hospital. He kept his professorship, but he had to resign from those posts um, because of further allegations. The hospital said that his resignation preempted the need for them to publish an investigation report. And then in 2010, there were further allegations about Eastall from other co-workers in other industry-sponsored trials. So I don't know if this was a single episode as the GMC claim, but the outcome of this GMC hearing was that Eastall retained his job and his National Clinical Excellence Award, Sheffield University, got rid of Aubrey Bloomsome, and he hasn't worked for a number of years because whistleblowers don't find it easy to get employment. Now, this may seem an old case, but it has more recent ramifications, which I'll get on to. This is another uh, case that I reported to the GMC in 1998. It took them a couple of years to get to uh, the hearing for Banerjee, 
who was suspended from the medical register for a year for research misconduct relating to a paper and an abstract in gut. Slightly different um, research, both on gut research, but uh, different aspects. And um, a few months later, his supervisor, Peter, uh, Professor Tim Peters, was also found guilty of serious professional misconduct. He had knowingly put his name as co-author on a false paper, but he received only a severe reprimand from the GMC and uh, returned to work. And in January 2002, that was three weeks after he got back on the register, Banerjee was suspended under interim orders and then was uh, struck off the medical register later in September 2002 because of um, financial misconduct and concerns about his clinical skills. Now, his financial misconduct was that as a consultant colorectal surgeon, he defrauded patients and insurers. And what he did, or some of the things he did, was to tell NHS patients, lie to them about waiting times for procedures. So if you went to him with uh, rectal bleeding, he told some patients that the NHS waiting time for a colonoscopy was over 20 weeks. It was actually two weeks, but he said he could do it privately. So people went to him privately, some without insurance, so they paid themselves. In some of those he then operated on, did things like total colectomies, when experts subsequently showed that they weren't needed. So people ended up with stomas that they didn't need. Uh, the histology showed they didn't need it. What's more, he did such botched operations that some of the people who ended up with stomas also ended up having their pelvic nerves cut such that they ended up incontinent of urine and impotent, as well as having a stoma they didn't need. Um, so there were some serious concerns about this man. But the real scandal is that knowledge of Banerjee's research misconduct was concealed by senior academics for a decade, that the full extent of his research misconduct has still not been addressed, and the knowledge of concerns about his clinical skills and harms to patients was also concealed for a decade. This is Tim Peters, who was also found guilty of serious professional misconduct. You see, he's got a research appointment at King's College, uh, London, or did have there, and he's retired now. Uh, Director of Pathology Services for the, the local NHS. Academic appointments at the university and at, King, at King's College and London University with teaching appointments, deanery appointments, and responsibility for higher degrees, postgraduates. And he was the editor of two journals. So this is a chap who should know about the integrity of the evidence base one imagines. 18 months after he was qualified, Banerjee had 49 publications, which is good going by any standard, I think. And interestingly, many of these um, publications were with very eminent people, professors, and one can understand why people are reluctant to look at the whole gamut of Banerjee's research. I mean, if I tell you that two of his papers were with a president of the Royal College of Physicians and one was with a president of the Royal College of Surgeons, you might get the idea that people didn't want too much digging around. Anyway, Banerjee got a joint appointment at King's College doing research in chemical pathology with Tim Peters and in clinical surgery with Professor Michael Baum. We know that at least seven whistleblowers repeatedly alleged to Peters that Banerjee was falsifying data. We know that um, three co-authors, or pe three people were offered co-authorship of a paper with Banerjee and Peters, and the three told Peters that they had no knowledge of the research and were not prepared to put their name on a paper they thought was fraudulent but Peters put his name on it. And uh, at the end of 1990, Banerjee admitted falsifying research in an abstract. Um, he'd made the mistake of using a radioactive isotope, or claiming to use a radioactive isotope, forgetting that people actually keep a check on radioactive isotope use. And there was no record of him having had any. And um, 
the university or the college, King's College, got uh, an investigation. We couldn't call it the, exactly an independent investigation. They got, he worked for Michael Baum part of the time, so they got his brother, who was the head of another department at King's, to investigate. But he found that there were problems with all of Banerjee's research going back to 88 when he started at King's. And we know that not only was this report seen by professors, uh, but by the Dean of the Faculty of Clinical Medicine, the, school of, uh, the Dean of the School of Medicine and Dentistry, the Secretary of the School of Medicine, and later by the Principal of King's College London. They all knew, but none of them told the GMC. What they did was, the evidence disappeared, the whistleblowers were silenced, the funders, the MRC and two charities were not informed and no repayment was made. They allowed Banerjee to submit the same falsified data to the London University for a Master of Surgery degree as a part of a thesis. And the university awarded it even though they were informed by one of their senior lecturers that the data was false. And subsequently, the same senior lecturer contacted them to say that he was being pressured by Professor Peters to withdraw his allegation. They also allowed him to submit the false research for a Hunterian professorship lecture at the Royal College of Surgeons. These are prestigious named lectures. Um, and we know that some senior fellows at the college were aware of the falsification. And these falsifications were not considered by the GMC, the MS, or the Hunterian professorship lecture. And it would have been embarrassing to do so I mean, at the time, at the GMC, the president of the Royal College of Surgeons, who had previously been an co-author with Banerjee, was a member of the GMC. And, of course, uh, Graham Cato was at the GMC, as we know, and was also uh, the, uh, then the dean of the medical school. And we know that there's evidence, that in fact, at uh, the GMC, Banerjee's first GMC hearing, his uh, lawyers admitted that the article, uh, is, uh, the data in his uh, paper in gut was incorporated in his Master of Surgery thesis. We know from his CV when he got a consultant post that uh, the same results... Uh, point here. Uh, th these results were uh, published in several papers, that's including the, the, the one they retracted uh, in my MS thesis and formed the base of the Ontario Professorship. What's more, at King's, uh, he was taken off clinical duties in surgery, and I've got documentary evidence, so where I've got the quotes there, documentary evidence. He, there was good reason on several occasions to doubt his clinical skills and because of his flawed decision making. Well, these are euphemisms. Patients died as a result of this. And a senior surgeon wrote to me a sort of rather um, confessional letter saying that he'd told senior people and then he decided to give up when nothing happened. And he said, the people I contacted are now in our offices in rural colleges around the UK I felt that enough damage had been done to the profession. So Banerjee moved to the West Midlands Surgical Rotation, but only stayed there a couple of months when he was sacked. And I've got the quote, he was the worst registrar we ever had. But he was immediately appointed to the Trent Surgical Rotation and got a consultant post in Halifax. And he had, at his second hearing, he was, as I said, struck off the medical register. The paper in Gut was retracted and so was the abstract. And Michael Farving, then the editor of Gut, compared the paper with um, the MS thesis. This is after the GMC hearing. And informed the university that they needed to look at the MS thesis because it appeared to be the same as the paper. But years later, despite me repeatedly writing to the university asking various questions, for example, how an entirely different professor claimed to have supervised this research, not Peters, not Baum, not uh, someone who claims to have supervised it could have done so when it was made up. 
The Royal College of Surgeons cannot or will not withdraw the Hunterian Professorship. And after five years, if you're struck off, you can apply to get back on the medical register. Now, Banerjee's clinical skills have been in doubt for 10 years. He was then struck off and didn't practice for seven years. And after that time, in a period when he hadn't practiced, he had presumably acquired enough good clinical skills for him to be allowed back on the medical register. When he was awaiting his GMC hearing a couple of months before that, he had been in 2000. He'd been suspended by a, uh, his hospital because of concerns about his clinical skills and because of financial misconduct. They called in the police. They called in the Royal College of Surgeons. He was suspended from the local private hospital in Elland. But at that time, the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh made him a fellow because he was such a good chap, presumably. And when he got reinstated on the medical register, they reinstated his fellowship, and he's got fellowships in Glasgow and Edinburgh since. But not only that, June last year in the Queen's Birthday Honours, he got an MBE for services to patient safety. Well, he didn't keep it long because I managed to get it removed, forfeited two months later by writing to every MP I could think of in national papers. Um, so these are just a few examples, and I could give you examples from other countries. I don't say we are worse than others. Um, but I've been involved in a number of other investigations, and it's my view that academic institutions usually try to conceal research misconduct. That involves silencing and discrediting whistleblowers, so generally whistleblowing has little effect on the integrity of the evidence base. And even in my most recent experience at the GMC, which was a case that started in November and ended in February, suggests that the GMC is unable to deal properly with research misconduct by doctors. Thanks. Uh, Peter's um, comments are open uh, for questions, but Peter, um, these are chilling examples. They certainly exist in the United States. I'm well aware of them, both around research misconduct around, as well as clinical uh, issues. Um, I didn't hear one. I didn't hear a solution. And I'm curious what you think a reasonable solution is. My understanding is there's about 200,000 physicians in the UK, maybe 10 to 20,000 academic physicians. So what, what would be a reasonable approach, uh, you think, uh, that would help not uh, necessarily respond to people who do uh, or uh, um, do, do uh, are, are subject to misconduct issues, but rather prevention. Is there a, an approach to prevention that you think could be effective? An approach to, preven to prevention of misconduct, or well, I, I think it's all about making uh, research more important to people in different ways. That is to say, I mean, it shouldn't be about promotion. I know lots of people who only did research because it was good for their career. They had no interest in it. I mean, I, I gave Banerjee's MS as an example, but I can tell you of six other higher degrees, MDs and PhDs, that I know to be fraudulent, and I know that people in their universities know Two were told, I was told by their supervisors, they've tried to get the universities to withdraw them and their universities won't because they said it would be bad for their reputation. They want to recruit students. They don't want any, any harm coming to their reputation. So it's, there is a problem. I mean, one of the things is we need to expose the, as many cases as we can and sack the people who do this. I mean, the example of Peter Richards and the GMC allowing him to return to hearing cases shows that the regulator has no idea of what is appropriate. But we see this throughout society, don't we, in, in, uh, not just in medicine. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I think we need a whole change in ethos, really. Yeah, one of the concerns in a lot of the misconduct uh, investigations in the US, particularly around lab-based science, when there's eight or 10 people as authors on the paper, that oftentimes the senior investigators claim it's an era of a more junior individual. 
and that they should not be held responsible. And that's become an increasing problem. And actually, there's a very complicated case at the Brigham in, in Boston where that is indeed the case, and actually the senior investigator has now sued the institution because they believe that their reputation was besmirched when the institution requested that the paper be withdrawn. And so it's even becoming more complicated in terms of legal issues in the United States. But uh, let's see if there's any questions there. Um, I'm wondering what could be done to train uh, students and early career researchers and people that just end up being in a position uh, where they see something go terribly wrong and uh, uh, they need to protect themselves uh, from being litigated uh, personally and having their lives ruined, but at the same time, they would like to better, better uh, you know, uh, help society. Uh, is, are there some steps that can be taken, uh, not only so people are protected, but that, but that there's specific ac accepted guidelines or something uh, where people can be trained, yes, you can say this, um, don't say this, uh, it'll, it'll go over the edge, because I think that there's a lot of, a, a lot of careers and lives that are unnecessarily ruined uh, because people don't know how to whistleblow correctly and it ends up taking over their whole lives. Peter, one minute answer. Uh, well, I think all we can do as a group is try to get the regulators to actually do what they should do, and that is not only, is to properly punish research misconduct because research misconduct harms patients. They don't see the connection sometimes. And secondly, um, to get the um, regulators to punish people who suppress whistleblowers. And they claim that they would do that but they just don't, and they really need to make sure that whistleblowers are protected, and that's down to the regulators, I think. Thank you, Peter. Coffee, posters, and the next session is at 3.30.